I thought we ought to start off by just saying what is HVDC because I don't want to make the assumption that everybody knows what we mean by high voltage DC transmission. And this is just a simple slide explaining the, the basic idea. Most of the HVDC in the world today is point to point. It connects one point in an AC system to another point in an AC system. Why do we do it? It keeps me employed, always a good idea. But besides that, it provides a firewall between networks. So systems that are connected with DC, we can control the power flow even during fault events. So if you have a fault in one network and that network is interconnected with AC, the other network will automatically support and see the same fault if they're interconnected AC. With DC, we can control the contribution to supporting your neighbor. So we can automatically regulate the power flow through the link, not just on what the operator has ordered, but on what the frequency is of the network to which we are connected. So we can say to our neighbors, we'll help you out only to the amount of power transfer that, will allow, that we can do safely without risking my particular power system. That comes into controllability as well. Lower transmission costs and lower transmission losses. Per kilometer of transmission, DC is a cheaper way of transmitting than AC. Interesting graph just plotted off um, the IEEE actually, list of um, HVDC schemes around the world. I started my career here around 1990, which was a pretty good time to get into HVDC. Because prior to that, it had all been kind of a very niche industry. Beyond this point, as you can see, it's accelerated rapidly. So now you can describe HVDC as the sexy end of the power transmission industry at dinner parties. I don't get invited to many dinner parties, but... <laughs> so what is HVDC? Very simply, with any power electronic converter, however complicated, all we can really do is convert AC into DC or DC into AC. So in a HVDC converter, we have two converters, one at an end where we want to transmit power from, and another converter at an end where we want to import power. Both converters control their D terminal DC voltage, and by the difference between the voltages, a current will flow. The two AC systems can be at the same frequency but out of phase, or they can be completely different frequencies. The interconnection is asynchronous, and the way that we normally control the HVDC link is we make one of these converters, we tell him his job is to control the DC voltage on the link, and the other converter controls the current. And you normally pick some point on that circuit, typically the point where you'll have the maximum DC voltage, which is the DC terminals of the rectifier, and we call that the compounding point. So the inverter typically will control the DC voltage, but it will control it as it sees it at the rectifier, taking into account the resistance of the transmission line and the current. And there's two basic forms of HVDC. There's point-to-point -point transmission. Um, that's a particularly long transmission scheme at nearly 2,400 kilometers, but the longest in the world. Um, but it's where you've got a, a source of, a large source of power generation, and you want to move it bulk movement of that power to where your load is and you want to cover a large distance. HVDC frequently works out to be the most economic way of doing the transfer. The other example I've got here is the GCCIA scheme. There was five countries uh, that wanted to interconnect their, their power grids. Four of those countries were on at 50 hertz. One country runs at 60 hertz, Saudi Arabia. The only way Saudi could joined into that power pool was to use HVDC in a back-to-back -back arrangement. So on the scheme on the left, the transmission distance is 2,375 kilometers. The scheme on the right, it's about eight meters of aluminum bus bar. But functionally, it's doing the same thing. And I know we've pitched this as voltage source converters and their rapid growth, but I think we really ought to stand the, understand the history first. And why, to date, has it been line commutated converters? Um, basically, the early technologies available was mercury arc and then thyristors. 
Thyristors um, performed as a six pulse bridge, there is a risk of a commutation failure. Um, so, which is a short through through the bridge. So, a collapse in DC volts because two conductors, two thyristors fire at the same time. From a HVDC design point of view, you can't stop that from happening. There is always the risk that there will be a sufficient magnitude shift in the AC system to cause a commutation failure. You can mitigate the risk, but there is always a risk it will happen. So we have to design for it. So we have to take into account the increase in junction temperature in the thyristors and the voltage that the thyristor will see on recovery. So from a design point of view of the valve, we have to take into account both the normal operation and we have to design it so that under different transient events, such as a commutation failure, we still remain within the envelope of the capability of the thyristor. What's important from a design point of view is how much margin we have to leave between normal operation and the commutation failure or the stressed point during a disturbance. We could build a line commutated converter using as a voltage source. We talk about voltage sources and line commutated converters. The line commutated converter could be a voltage source. We could use a capacitor as the energy storage on the DC side. But if you've got a commutation failure, you've got unlimited current circulating in that. You've got very high current, very high junction temperatures. It's not a practical way of doing it. Put a big inductor in, you control the current. You control the current, therefore that is a current source converter. And typically that's how all HVDC has been built today. Line commutated converters, because the technology available is the thyristor. And current source, because we want to limit the current in those thyristors under disturbed events. The technology really started back in the, the 50s and up to the 70s, the main technology was mercury arc valves. Beyond the 70s, it's been uh, thyristors. Really, very rapidly, the thyristor came in in the early 70s. Very rapidly, we got up to 500 kV as sort of the de facto standard. One or two oddball schemes, but pretty much all at 500 kV until recently. And then we've got 660 kV in the last five years. We've got 800 kV as two 12 pulse bridges in series. We're now building in India. We're seeing 800 kV as a single 12 pulse bridge. And there's even talk in China of doing 1100 kV in HVDC, which is, is a scary prospect. You've got to bear in mind that when you're designing a HVDC scheme, one of the biggest thing that you have to get to site is the transformer. That's the biggest thing. So whatever we've got, everything else is shipped. The valves are dead easy to ship. They come in a packing case and you assemble them on site. The transformer is one big thing that you have to take to site. Um, and it can be very often the thing that influences your design. If there's a bridge that you've got to go under, that will limit the height of the transformer. That will mean you have to have a higher leakage reactant than you, what you would have ideally liked from a power electronics design point of view. If you've got to go over the bridge, you've got to get the weight down. So maybe you can't get the amount of impedance in the transformer that you want. 1100 kV, they're talking about building the valve hall first, using it as an assembly plant for the transformers, so they ship the transformers in bits, assemble them on site, put them outside, and then populate the valve hall with the valves. It's big. Going back again, history. So early schemes, 1967, mercury arc valves. Mercury arc valves, by the 70s, were being replaced by thyristors. And the point of this slide really is to say the technology has been driven fundamentally by the semiconductors. So early in the 70s, we were using 4 kV, 37 millimeter devices, and we'd got three in parallel. They were outdoor um, uh, porcelain cylinders, oil, oil cooled. We went to air cooled in the 80s, using 56 mil devices, two in parallel. Air cooled predominantly because the CGB at the time said, you can't mix water and power electronics. No. So we didn't. But then in the 80s, we did, and we used um, a water cooling, 5.2 kV, 100 millimeters, 76 mil, uh, oh, sorry, 100 mil thyristors. And then really since the early 2000s, we've got a more standard approach of the, uh, the, the valve, the bit around the semiconductor, and we're able to use 
8.5 kV or 7.2 kV devices and different diameters which we can optimize for the scheme. So that's where we are with LCC and just the state of the HVDC industry. But today we've got two options to us, both LCC and in some applications where it's better for an economic point of view, voltage source converters. Voltage source converters, like I said, LCC has been around since the early 50s. VSC really has only started since the late 90s. And bearing in mind, we're now in 2015. The first ski, this is a paper extracted from the uh, CRED website, uh, and it's reporting on the first ever HVDC scheme using voltage source converter technology, which is really um, forced commutation devices as opposed to line commutation devices. It's configured as a voltage source converter. So that was not that long ago, and that was the first scheme. And since then, only the sort of in the last 20 years, we've gone through three different generations of that type of converter. So early converters were two level sine wave, pul sine wave pulse width modulation control. That rapidly got on to three level converters using um, pulse width modulation, but with a, a triple and harmonic it had added in. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and then 2004, sort of we got up to 350 megawatts. The three level converter had dropped out of favor because of complexity of control and we'd gone back to two level converters but using optimal pulse width modulation, which basically means use a lower fr switching frequency, reduce the switching losses in the converter, but accept the fact that you're generating some harmonics into the power system and use passive filtering to remove them. This has been, to, I appreciate this is very simple for this audience, but just to explain what we're talking about with PWM, that's a nice simple circuit. In reality, that power converter is smothered in filtering and reactors. And this reactor in particular is a very special animal indeed. Because the inter-winding inter capacitance means that the voltage stress on those windings is very, very high. And it's uh, a very difficult, very bespoke uh, reactor to build. So it's not a standard reactor by any means. And if you look at one of these stations, these two-level converter stations, they're just great big tin boxes. Everything's got shielding on them because there is so much radiated interference from the, the switching of the, of the converter. And that was always seen as a problem. So we got, we'd gone from, in terms of losses, at the, the original early schemes were sort of 4% 4, 4 loss, 5% loss with a two-level converter. Using optimal pulse width modulation, they got those losses down to about 2.5%. Still quite high, and you've still got the complexity of the high free switching frequencies, and therefore the disturbance on the, the, the amount of control you have to do for the ele electromagnetic disturbance and the impact on the other components. So there was lots of attempts to look at other devices, so for example, flying capacitor converters, but these really didn't take off. But just to show that there were lots of other attempts. And this um, highlights another issue that we have from our perspective as a business, uh, compared to maybe other businesses, in that what we rev regard as risk is predominantly our ability to deliver it to site on time, switch it on and walk off while the lights are still on. That's a plus. And there's no smoke. Normally, no, no smoke is a good as well. Our customers, if you talk to them, they own these things. They cost them, they value them over a period of 20 years or 30 years. So we have to design them for 20, 30, even 40 years and sometimes life, life uh, um, system operation life capacity. Our customers worry what happens in 10 years' time. Are we going to be able to buy the components that you've used in that thing today, or are we going to hold enough, be able to hold enough spares to maintain that equipment for the next 30 years? Are we going to have the skilled labor 
to be able to maintain that equipment for the next 30 years. Skilled labour is an interesting one. We've got control systems that are still in service today that have been in service for 40 years using analogue components, transistors, which are all bought to military spec. And, and they're still working. In fact, I was speaking to one of our customers uh, recently, and they were saying that the, the reason that they're having problems now is not the, the control system itself, but the fact that some of the components are mounted on a swing gate, and they've discovered that when they now open the cubicle, well, they did open the cubicle to do some maintenance on it, and afterwards there was a fault with that equipment, and they, have, they spent a long time trying to work out what it was, and it turned out that one of the wires had cracked in the swing gate, because it's been there for 40 years. And if they wanted to maintain that now, there are very few people that they employ that can maintain it, because it's analog control. With digital controls, there is an expectation, really, that every 15 years today, you're going to have to replace the control system. So it's always in the back of their mind, what risk are they taking on by buying that equipment? And if we look at the development of semiconductors and how that's influenced the development of VSC and where we are today, two-level converters of various types have been around for a very long time. This is a two-level converter. The, bar, the, the, the canal boat comes in at the bottom, it gets lifted up, and it sails out, two levels. That was built in 1875 on the Trenton Mersey Canal. A different approach was built by Telford in 1822, which is the Caledonian Canal, which raises the, about the same, 50 feet on the first one, 50 feet raise on the boat, this one 64 feet. But this is a multi-level converter, because it's got lots of steps in between. So it, the point here, really, what I'm trying to say from an engineering point of view, there's nothing new. Nobody ever invents something new. They just find a better way of applying what's available today that might not have been available yesterday. Or taking something that was developed somewhere else and using it in a new form. And the multi-level converter itself, from a power engineering point of view, has been around for a long time. This is a patent from 1975. And I'm sure lots of you can recognise, there we've got full bridge converters, we've got four switches, a battery, that's connected in series, and, oh look, we can make a sine wave out of it. So that's back in 1975, that's the earliest application I'm aware of, of uh, modular multi-level converters in a ele power electronic or electronic circuit. And what is? a modular multi-level converter? Well, basically, we have lots of little steps, and we connect them all in series, and we build up a sine wave from those individual steps. And you need surprisingly few steps, relatively speaking, to get to a decent enough sine wave to mean that the harmonic content of that waveform is adequate for connection to the grid. So there's another example of three, and we've used switches to represent the IGBTs, or the, 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 the power semiconductors, and we can get various steps by interconnecting or bypassing the capacitors. And we really started to apply these back in the 90s, when the gate turn-off thyristor was the developed technology of the day. And we applied them not for HVDC, because at the time there wasn't the market or the, 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 the vision of using them in that technology because of the costs associated with them. But where they were seen to be possibly used was in reactive power control, in shunt reactive power control. Um, conventional reactive power control in a power system uses um, either switch capacitors, which are switched in or out with a thyristor valve or a thyristor controlled reactor where you phase control the, val the thyristor valve which varies the amount of inductance that the power system sees and therefore you have a variable reactor connected to the power system. Both this conventional technologies, both the TSC and the TCR, 
use real reactors, real capacitors. So they have volume. They need a lot of space. And they also generate noise. So the StatCon was really introduced because there we've got a power converter which can mimic the behavior of the TCR and the TSC without actually physically having the reactors and the capacitors there. And this was an early sub-module. And we were building these at 75 megavars for connection to the power system. And 16 steps, including a redundant level, so 15 steps was good enough to meet the harmonic content connected to the power system. We didn't need filters beside that. And that was a GTO-based SATCOM. And the thing I want to point out, really, is the gate units. So we've got two GTOs, and those are the gate units. They're about the size of a shoebox. And I make that point, I'll make the point at this, uh, at this time. This is a big, bulky bit of power electronic. I don't know what the litres are of this. That's the first time I've ever heard. And it really threw me yesterday when everybody started talking about litres. I'm thinking, water, and why are you measuring? But anyway, really confused me that did. But I kind of worked out what you're on about in the end. Um, I don't know what the litres are per kilowatt of this, but probably not that high. That gate unit right there the G for the GTO, about the size of a shoebox. What we're doing today with IGBTs, about the size of my phone. So today's modular multi-level converter. Basically, if you take two stack comms, so here we've got one stack com, so we've got three power converter valves interconnected in a star arrangement. We take two of those, so we've got two stack comms in parallel. I haven't grounded the neutral point on these two converters, so what that means is I can generate a voltage difference between those neutral points. And if I redraw the circuit, I've got a HVDC converter. <coughs> it's the same circuit. Now, conventional wisdom in the early 2000s would have been to build that using uh, a as a voltage source converter using IGBTs or GTOs and uh, large capacitors would have not been cost effective. So you'd have to have created a demand, it had to been a really specific case where that would have been useful to do in a power system. Professor Rene Marquardt in, when was this paper? Uh, 2003, came up with the idea of, if you're going to use these in HVDC, we don't need all the components. We can throw away two of the IGBT or the, the switching devices because we only need these two states of operation. That's good enough to give us reactive power control into the AC system and DC uh, voltage control on the DC side. We've taken away two of this IGBT, so we've reduced the capital cost. More importantly, we've reduced the losses because we've reduced the, the, IGB, the power semiconductors that the power has to flow through. So now, modular multi-level converters using uh, series bridge submodules interconnected becomes feasible. And at this point now, we're talking about potentially losses. We've gone from sort of 4 or 5% loss down to 2.5% loss. We're now talking losses of the order of about, when this was first introduced 10 years ago, possibly about 1.5%. One, one we're now down to 1 or just below 1% using similar technology, but with the improvement. <coughs> that compares with LCC technology, where we're about 0.7%. Losses. By 0.7%, what we're talking about there is you take the rating of the converter, so if it's a 1,000 megawatt converter, 1% 1 of 1,000 megawatts is 10 megawatts, so it's 10 megawatts of loss for that converter at full power output. And typically, we have to meet capitalised losses. So when we sell equipment, we sell it as capitalised loss. So that means that the customer will give a price per kilowatt for every loss that we declare, every kilowatt of loss we declare, we have to guarantee it, there'll be penalties if we don't achieve it, so we can't make it up. 
Um, but that price will get added on to our selling price to evaluate our offer against other people's offers. And typically in Europe at the moment, we're talking between 3,000 and 5,000 euros per kilowatt as the evaluated cost of losses. The disadvantage of this compared with the full bridge is this diode here. Because if we get a fault on the DC side now, I can't stop the current. With a fire resistor valve, I could remove the firing pulses. At the next current zero, the fire resistor would turn off. I've electronically interrupted the fault current on the DC side. Because there's a diode in that circuit between the terminals of each submodule, if there's a fault on the DC side, my primary protection now must be the AC breaker. I have to open the AC breaker. But from a European perspective, if we think that most of the schemes are point to point, most of the schemes are cable, if you've got a cable fault, it's going to take you days or weeks, or if it's a submarine cable, potentially months to repair. So tripping the AC breaker may be not that bad a thing. So this technology has taken off, and it's taken off very rapidly. But it's taken lots of other technologies behind it to come forward. So like we looked at the uh, GTO before and the gate electronics required to drive that. IGBTs, early 90s, there wasn't really that great a supply in the market for them at decent voltages and current that we could use for transmission of power. Today, we can use a standard IGBT. It's available from many suppliers. We can get the same rating. We tend to use these IGBT modules. Disadvantage is that they have an open circuit failure mode, so that's something we have to design into the circuit, how to deal with that. And I've put down here 3.3 kV, 1,500 amps. You can now do better than that. You can now get 1,800 amps. You can now get 4.5 kV at those sort of current ratings. Um, but not from multiple suppliers. And from our point of view, again, as, a, as an industrial supplier of this type of equipment, we have to ensure that we can buy all the things that we buy from different sources. We can't be restricted to just buying from one source in the market. So I'm afraid to say we do use a Lego approach. And it's not just the power electronics, the IGBTs, that have come on in the last 20 years or 30 years. It's the control systems themselves. Things that we are doing with the control systems today for VSC, for multi modular multi-level converters, we couldn't have tried to do 20 years ago with the electronics that were available. We're now trying to get many, many, many individual converters to operate in a coordinated fashion. And it's, it's a bit like flying in formation. And if they get it wrong, it's a bit disastrous. And if we get it wrong, it's also disastrous from the point of view of the power system. So there's been developments in the control systems and the availability of sp and speed of operation of control systems. Communication systems, because we have to communicate to the power electronics. And we've used fiber optics for many, many, many years. Fiber optics were originally designed as cold light sources um, for experimentation. They've been adopted by communications, they've been adopted now for sensors, and they've been developed and moved on. And I like this, I don't really understand this slide, I like this slide because it does highlight the fact that traditionally on LCC valves, we've used a type of step index fiber at the top. You can get a lot of information down there, but at a certain rate, because for a spike on the input, you get a spreading of the data on the output. So it, it limits the data rate which you can transfer data through on a fiber optic. Today, and again, not, not because we've done it as a HVDC industry, because the HVDC industry couldn't afford to do the development of all the communications required, but looking at what else other people are doing and learning from that, broadband and cable TV into people's houses, the last 20 years, that's seen an awful lot of development in what, what's available now, and the price for all that technology has come crashing down. 
So we can now sit on the back of all that information and we can use much better uh, single mode fibers where the data rate, you can get much higher data rate down them. Uh, we can use passive optical networks so we can get, instead of having one fiber for each individual power semiconductor as we do with LCC, we can now use one fiber to talk to many tens of IGBTs or even submodules. So that technology has come on which has allowed us to develop HVDC further and the VSC further. So in terms of half bridge, uh, multi-modular, IGBT, IGBT based um, HVDC, the trans base scheme was the first one that was ever put into service as a commercial product and that was in 2012. We're now in 2015 and um, we're already talking about thousands of mega, a thousand megawatts and 320 kV. So the step change, having proven the technology or got the technology into service once, the market for this technology had rapidly increased. People, the power industry has accepted modular multi-level converters surprisingly quickly and the, the application of it is increasing very dramatically. So as an example, again, half bridge modular multi-level converter, that's a basic technology. And within that, each one of those sub-modules, we've got the two IGBTs, the capacitor. We also have um, a bleed resistor so that to keep that capacitor safe so the capacitor gets discharged if the sub-module is, is disconnected. So the, the capacitor doesn't retain energy indefinitely. We have um, a thyristor because this diode isn't really very good, the one that you buy in the standard IGBT packages. So we, it needs help during certain fault conditions. So we put a thyristor in parallel with that. And because the failure mode of these IGBTs is open circuit, we have to put a shorting switch in. Because the way we deal with redundancy in HVDC is that you put additional equipment in series. So you put additional power electronics in the valve. So in the case of a modular multi-level converter, we put additional series sub-modules in. If a sub-module fails, what we expect it to do is short out and the rest of the scheme, and the scheme continues to operate. Because typically, we would only do rate maintenance every two years. So in theory, you do maintenance, you close up the valve hole, you switch it on, you don't go back in and do any maintenance on that equipment for two years. So you've got to have enough redundancy in there such that if there are any failures, it doesn't interrupt the power supply. Because if it does, then the lights go out and people complain. Just an example of a scheme that's under construction at the moment, 300 kV DC, two 720 megawatt uh, symmetrical monopoles, uh, and it's, this is being built in Sweden at the moment between a place called Barkerid and Hoover. And that's a picture of the valve. It's actually moved on from this now. This is an old picture under construction. We talked again a lot about the volume of power electronics and how much you can press it down and, and the efforts doing in that. The power electronics represent probably about 20% of the volume of the valve hall. If that, most of the valve hall is air. Because at 300 kV, you need about two and a half meters of air to stop it flashing over. So making it smaller isn't the big driver for us as it is for some of the other industries. Weight is important though, of course, because this is a floor mounted one you noticed previously, the LCC ones were hanging from the roof. The present day MMC, modular multi-level converter, is really too heavy to hang from the roof, so we're floor mounting it. But if you're floor mounting it, you have to put thicker concrete underneath. So it has an impact. If we could make it lighter, we could make the concrete thinner, we could make the building cheaper. And the building probably represents between 10 and 20% of the contract value. And probably should have said earlier, but when we're talking about something like this, the contract value for this scheme, for the, power, for the converter part, 
was about 200 million pounds. So that's the kind of the number. A cheap scheme for us is probably about 50 million. Some of the schemes that we're looking at are 800 kV, probably pushing about 350 million. But that's the, that's, that's the world in which we inhabit. So I say, um, lots of air. You can see here, the AC connection is at the bottom of this converter. But remember, it's 300 kV DC. So the AC side is at about 400 kV AC. So we've got to have 400 kV AC insulation at the bottom, which means that the top of that, so if you're going to do maintenance on that power converter up here, that's 10 metres off the ground. So it's not just the air clearance we have to allow for, we've also got to allow for maintenance, so somebody can actually get in there and get 10 metres off the ground. So there's lots of things that you have to think about that aren't necessarily power electronics, but they affect how you design the power electronics. And it's not just the converters themselves. Uh, this was talked about yesterday, really, but um, we've had to come up with new methods of modelling. You could do 500, you could do 800 kV thyristor valves, but when you come to do simulations for power system interactions, it's one valve because you switch them all at the same time. Two level converters, it's one valve from a systems representation because you switch them all at the same time. With uh, MMC converters, we've now got discrete steps. If we go back to that circuit there, each one of those valves has got 350 steps in it. So there's 350 individual converters in each valve. There's six valves in that valve hall, and there's four valve halls in this scheme. So to simulate that and to do power system simulations, we can't model 350 sub-modules with the IGBTs, the capacitors, everything in there. Because if we'd got the project five years ago, we might be waiting for the first simulation to finish running now, even on our best computers that we have. So we've had to develop new modeling techniques, not to represent the details of what's going in at the power semiconductor level, but to represent the power converter from a system's point of view so we can see how it interacts with the system. And it's not just the modelling. We've got to prove to our customers that this equipment will actually work. Something that we always have to go through with the control equipment is called factory acceptance testing. So you have to have a simulator in our laboratory. We get the contract control equipment, we plug it into that simulator, and we prove that that control system will do what we've said it will do. But with the simulation of the power system to which it's connected and the converters themselves. But this is a whole new technology, so we've had to work with the suppliers of things like real-time digital simulators to develop new techniques that would allow us to do the modeling of the MMC so that we've got something to connect our control system to to prove the functionality. And I just put this in again. I, I make no apologies. I lifted all the data off Wikipedia. Best source of information ever. Might not be accurate, but the point, it does highlight the fact that for a long time, the state of the art has been about 150 kV DC. Again, nothing to do with the power semiconductors. It's been to do with the cables. Because really, VSC was born not of the power electronics and the application of the power electronics, but it was born of mass extruded cable technology for DC application, which is lighter, so you can get more on a drum, so it's cheaper to install, so it was more cost effective for the suppliers. But mass impregnated cable can't stand voltage with reversals. And line commutated converter, you reverse the volts to reverse the power flow, and certain fault conditions you see voltage reversals. That's a problem, VSC, it's unipolar, the DC volts doesn't reverse, it's the chosen technology. A long time, I say the cable limit has been at 150. Recently, there's A, more cable suppliers, there's more competition, and 320 kV has, has been introduced into the um, uh, plastic extruded cable market, XLPE market. The other thing to note is the green line. You can see that 
this is 20 years. We've gone steadily up over the, until about 2012. 2012, remember, that's when the first MMC was put into service, and we're now up here. That's a hell of a technology jump from my perspective. So where are we going? Well, I said before, one of the drivers for the technology that we're using today was the realization that you could throw away two of the IGBTs. The disadvantage is that if there's a fault on the DC side, you have to trip the AC breaker. That's okay if you've got a cable scheme because the cable will take longer to repair anyway. It's still, from a HVDC point of view, an uncomfortable reality because if we've got line commutated converters, the practice is always to use your converter as the primary fault clearing mechanism. So you block the power electronics, you stop the current flow, you wait for about 150 milliseconds, the wind blows, the fault on an overhead transmission line can deionize, um, the, the ionization spreads away, you can then deblock the converter, re-energize the line, carry on transmitting power, everybody's happy. And you can give it multiple shots, so you can keep trying. Can't do that with half-bridge MMC. So people are now looking to use full bridge MMC because that will allow us to fault block. So despite me saying earlier that it was going to be too lossy and too expensive, people have now accepted the idea of VSC in the market. They want to apply VSC to their power systems. They want the reactive power control independent from the real power transfer. They want all the benefits that VSE brings, but they now also want to be able to clear faults on overhead lines. So we're going back to full bridge converters to be applied, but now as a HVDC converter. And of course, the losses aren't as bad now as they were because we've learned a lot doing the half bridge converters. So we have better switching algorithms. We don't switch it often, so we brought the switching losses down. We've got better components, better IGBTs. The world has moved on. Still, with the, the, the converter that we've got today, each one of those valves has to be able to go from the positive rail to the negative rail on the DC bus. Has to be a full converter rating. So, technology, I don't think today that we can say that, as with LCC, the 12, bolt, 12 pulse bridge is the given technology for line commutated converters and has been for many, many years. I don't think we've reached that point with VSC or MMC even as to say we know what the technology is, we can draw the circuit out. There's still options. So instead of doing that type of circuit, we are actively investigating the idea of combining full bridge and what we call director switches. So we have a series element of just a, uh, a series switch that removes part of the sine wave so that the full bridge converters only have to deal with part of the sine wave. This means that we can now use full, we can get, use full bridge converters so we can block DC side faults, we can get the same functionality as we had with the half bridge converter and we can get the losses to about the same value. I did mention about th uh, third harmonic injection for, for a while ago. Typically, the transformer is connected star on the primary side, delta on the secondary side. Um, I make this point now because I have this argument a lot with some of our, our colleagues, uh, particularly in academia. I said that quickly so nobody noticed. Uh, the power system transformer, the power system side transformer, is almost always for our business a star connected, a star wound either solidly grounded or grounded via an impedance transformer. Because if you get a single line to ground fault on the power system at 400 kV, you don't want the other two phases going from, uh, from 400 kV line to line to 400 kV line to ground, which is what they would do. So almost always the line side is a star wound connection, which means if we want to put a delta in there, that's what the converter side has to be. We can't play games with what side we put the delta on. But what we do frequently do is we introduce a third harmonic uh, zero-phase sequence component and we introduce it in the same phase 
in all, on all three, sorry, the same sequence in all three phases. So the consequence of that is that across the winding, we don't have a voltage differential at third harmonic, so there's no current flowing, so there's no third harmonic injected onto the primary side. But it does mean that we can do use better we can make better utilization of the power semiconductors. And that's quite common practice. But then just a thought, if we can make add third harmonic, what other wave shapes can we make? So we're investigating other types of converter topology. So this is a series bridge converter where the red element represents a series valve uh, of using a power semiconductor which has a high current carrying capability. But we put around it other devices to shape the waveform to remove the harmonics or to reduce the harmonics. And maybe in the future that would offer a lower footprint, a higher power throughput than the converters that we have today. Another alternative, again using the wave shaping capability of the, uh, the full bridge or half bridge submodules, is to <coughs> you go back to conventional thyristors, but again put across in parallel with each one of them a wave shaping circuit to improve the harmonic performance of those converters. And with that, I will now shut up and say thank you very much for listening to me.